and welcome to the first installation of a new segment that I'm trying out. I'm calling this the Straight Beer Book Club, and what I plan to be doing in this series of videos is to review books that are either um, beer related or um, possibly literature or other stories, novels that involve beer. So the book I'm reviewing today is called uh, Beer Money. A, it's subtitled A Memoir of Privilege and Loss. And it's written by Frances Stroh. You may recognize the name. Um, she is one of the granddaughters or great-granddaughters of the Stroh family. Now I do realize that this is a relatively long video, so I, I understand if you're not here to watch the whole thing, if there's just a couple of sections that you were interested in, uh, if you landed on this page just to see beer things, or if you somehow through a search um, are interested in some other aspects of this video. I will have you here on this page for you as a section where you can link or where you can click and jump to uh, that section of the video where I discuss that topic that is most interesting to you. So I'm going to start off talking about the Stroh family. Also I discuss the Gross Point and the greater Detroit area in general. Uh, there's a section where I talk about the Stroh Brewery Company and how she discusses that. And I also have a section where I talk about Fran Stroh's art and how that impacted and how that uh, uh, was reflected in her book. And lastly, I give a, a critical review of the book as, an, as a whole. So just a, a general review and my thoughts on, on the, the reading of the book. So feel free to click a link here. Otherwise, then keep watching and in a couple of seconds I'll continue my uh, review of the book. And uh, so I wanted to first discuss the, the, uh, the family element of the book. Of course, you may be familiar with Stroh's, it's a, it's a nationwide brand, and, um, but it has a long history. It started in the mid-1800s in Detroit with a man named Bernard who had um, emigrated from Germany. And with him he brought his beer recipes and started a brewery once he got established in Detroit. The beer was very successful. Initially he was hawking it door to door. He would brew it in the big barrels and in a wagon, would go door to door selling it to any of his neighbors in the area. And got big enough and was doing well enough that he was able to build an actual production facility brewery um, in the city of Detroit. And he was selling beer from there for a number of years and the, the business grew and grew until obviously the depression and the prohibition came. And during prohibition the, the way that they got through the, the Depression years was uh, they are known for, at least locally in the Detroit area, they're known for their Stroh's ice cream. And that was one of the businesses that they used to, to keep alive. So they would um, make and sell various different flavors of ice cream that was very popular and still is around the area today. Uh, they would also sell things like near beer, so beer that was kind of flavorful like a beer but without the alcohol. And one interesting anecdote that came from the, the story or from the book that you won't find in Wikipedia um, is Fran says that apparently during the prohibition that the production facility that the family produced maple syrup. Um, and they knew that this maple syrup wasn't just for pancakes and sausages, but it was actually being used by home brewers who were kind of subverting the law and making their own home brew. I found that a kind of a, an interesting little side note. Uh, she doesn't go into depth any more than just to mention it, but I thought I'd mention it here too because uh, since we're a beer uh, vlog, uh, it's interesting for us to, to learn. Um, in modern times, the story talks about the family, um, her father's father, so her grandfather, had three sons, and her father being the youngest, uh, he was treated harshly by his father, and uh, he was kind of looked down upon. He was, the, he was the artsy one in the family. He wasn't too interested in, in the family business per se. Uh, but as he grew and matured, he became, you know, enveloped into the, the beer uh, production, the beer business. And so he became one of the marketing guys. I'm not sure, and don't even remember if she details what his exact title was, if he was director or VP or a chief or whatever it may be. He was involved in the marketing of the beer for a number of years through the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, so her father was in the marketing and she had three other siblings, so she was the third of four children, the other three being all brothers. And uh, the story mostly revolves, as it relates to the family, revolves around them as a nuclear family with her parents and her siblings. 
and uh, ultimately it deals with, at, towards the end of the book, the death of uh, two of these family members. So her brother immediately older than her, so the second oldest child, whose name was Charlie, he um, became addicted to drugs and alcohol, and ultimately the, the demons from that, um, from, the, from those addictions got the better of him, and he, was, uh, he died at an early age. And uh, also of her father, who did live into the early 2000s, uh, but again, uh, this poor fortune fell upon him, and so he ended up dying as well. And it, the, towards the end of the book, it deals with her coping with those uh, losses of the family that was close to her. The, the next thing that I'd like to talk about um, is the area of Michigan that she lived in. Um, so it's not just Detroit, but also some of the one of the eastern suburbs where they resided called Gross Point. And it's interesting to me because I also happen to live in Gross Point right now to see how she talks about you know living as a child in the 60s and 70s, a little bit into the 80s of what it was like in this area um, where she lived. And so it was a very different suburb at the time. It was a time. It was a place where, you know, in the mid 1900s, you had the descendants of the Ford families, of Firestone, of the Dodges, and of course, it made sense with, with all the um, known magnates of industry to have also the Stroh family there. So not only her own specific family, but her cousins and aunts and uncles all lived in Gross Point as well. And so to hear their stories was very interesting. So for example, um, she through the stories she tells, she, she conveys an exhaustive list of some of the extravagances that they saw or that they themselves benefited from. So for example, all of the housekeepers or the nannies and the cooks and the gardeners and the pool boys or just the private schools and the boarding schools of, you know, these kids were being sent to boarding schools and by the way, all of the Stroh kids were sent to boarding schools and were all returned home. So they, they didn't last very long before being kicked out, each one of them. It's kind of a, a point of, of the story how each of them kind of defies their, their family and rebels and, and essentially being kicked out of boarding school is one way. She also discusses how her father had vast collections that he liked to, uh, to build. And the story starts, the very first chapter is about her as a young child, maybe at the age of five or six, um, taking a trip to New York. And so she discusses a trip to Fifth Avenue and the, the various shops and F.A.O. Schwartz and you know just shopping spree, whatever she wanted her dad would buy for her, uh, as well as going into a restaurant and without even ordering or without even looking at the menu, just ordering whatever he wanted. And because he was well enough known, the chefs would just make whatever he wanted because he had the money and he was willing to pay whatever they asked and it didn't even matter. It was a small consequence to him. Uh, so he collected, among other things, uh, art, get art collections. He had a collection of pipes, uh, old-fashioned guns, antique guns. These are some of the things that he liked to build. Oh, one of his things, because I mentioned earlier, he was an artist or he fancied himself an artist. He had a large collection of cameras and he liked to take uh, portraits and photographs. There was a story of uh, a housekeeper. So they, they also had a housekeeper in their home, of, of course, naturally. And the, there was one story that she tells where this woman who is an African-American woman lives from the the west side of Detroit, which is the total opposite end of the city from where uh, Gross Point is located. So you can imagine it would be a, probably an hour or so bus drive plus maybe a mile or multiple miles of walking to get to her, uh, to her job every day. And she, one day as she's brushing Fran's hair, says, you know, you guys are so lucky, you're, you're so rich, and you don't realize, you know, how, how great and how lucky you are. And so after that, Fran talks and talk, turns to her mother and talks to her later in the day and says, do you know, she said that we were rich. And her mom says, no, no, honey, we're not rich. You know, and she talks about the kids at the pool who, um, when they go to the country club, they can stay at the pool and they can order and run up large bills and tabs and stay at the pool all day and, you know, eat whatever they'd like. But for Fran, her family wasn't quite so well off that they could run up large bills at the pool. They actually had to re return home for their lunch and then go back to the pool or to the country called later on. So this was an example of how they're not rich. 
so I, I also was interested in the book, not just from the gross point aspect, which was interesting to me, uh, but also because I like Detroit and things um, dealing with nostalgia uh, of the city in general. And so she discusses a lot of things about growing up in Detroit and seeing its uh, its downfall essentially from you know when this brewery was was built and in its heyday in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s Detroit was a, a bit of a, a bustling city and the by the time the book ends into the uh, I would say even say into the 80s uh, you can you can start to see her narrative starts to change about the city where it's run down and you know people like to burn houses just for just for sport or you know she knows by the time she's a teenager she knows all the dark alleys and and uh, you know sinister places to go do dirty deeds and so it's kind of interesting to get that aspect of, of the city that she's known you know growing up through the 60s and 70s onto the uh, the company part the beer part of the, of the book that I was interested in so she talks about a little bit of the hierarchy of the, the corporate hierarchy or the structure of Stroh's Brewing Company. And of course, it's a family business, so the family was an, inherited a lot of the main chief positions. So the CEO was her uncle, and she had cousins in multiple positions, and her father was in the marketing, and one of them, her other uncles was the chief of operations. And uh, so the story that she weaves, in a sense, in her own narrative, is that the the company the leadership is so heavily family oriented that any other leadership decision or strategic move that they would like to make they deferred to the family um, especially in, in board situations in particular when the when the uh, when the leadership is facing the board and is discussing strategic decisions to take into the future um, whatever the family decided as the board is what the company would go with. And so it was this kind of uh, deference to the family that kind of was a, a dynamic dynamic that kind of ran through the story and the downfall eventually of, uh, of the brewing company. Uh, one of the things that she says is how they were slow to change as a part of this deference is the family was very conservative and didn't want to, you know, rock the boat too much or enter into choppy waters. They liked to keep things how they were, but they wanted to be successful and they still wanted to receive their income and, 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 and grow and, and do great things. And they wanted this uh, beer company to, to do wonderful things. And even they divested outside of beer. They went into uh, commercial real estate and uh, biotechnology, these different things that kind of distracted from the primary business of brewing. Uh, in the end, the, the story turns out that it was they were a little bit slow to make these changes to stay a viable uh, brewing company. In the 70s, when Anheuser-Busch was really growing in cores, in a, to a certain extent, was, was growing and getting a national footprint, um, Stroh's was still, by and large, a, a regional player, uh, mostly in Detroit and Michigan, but even just mostly Midwestern, if they had any uh, outside, uh, I guess, interstate commerce at all. And so they realized a little too slowly that they were losing market share, and so they needed to gain a larger footprint nationally. And they did so by purchasing Schlitz in Milwaukee. And Schlitz was a was a good acquisition, I guess you could say. But they acquired a lot of debt doing so, and they could never re they could never gain enough enough revenue to offset that debt that they took on. Schlitz was just too big, and as in Schlitz and Strohs were. Um, uh, equal breweries in size, more or less. So it was one buying the other is, became burdensome for the for the one company that's the purchaser, especially considering the things that I mentioned already about you know they're slow to move and they 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 don't do things very uh, efficiently. So to take on a whole other company equal size to them just didn't help the case at all. Also, they were a little slow to release a light beer. So in the early '80s or late '70s, early '80s when Coors Light and Bud Light and Miller Light, these things were all coming out and were so, so popular with the public, Coors just kind of sat on their haunches and they didn't do anything until the mid 80s when they finally released a Stroh's Light. So things like that kind of hurt their business. So they eventually, in the late 90s, they were faltering so badly that they ended up selling off their all of their brands. And they sold most of them to, uh, to Pabst and so Pabst right now owns the majority of the Stroh's brands. 
And we saw recently, and I actually did a news article earlier this year, uh, may have been in August, I will put a link to the, well, better yet, I will put the video right over my shoulder, and you can click on that link and it'll take you straight to the, the video concerning this article, um, or this news item, because what happened earlier this year was Pabst decided to brew a Stroh's beer again in Detroit. Uh, I'll, I'll save you all the details if you just want to click on the link uh, above to hear what the details of that is. Um, that, that would be great and I'll save a lot of time here. So the next theme that Fran focuses on in her story in, in the book is art. So her father was an art uh, fan or fancied himself an artist. He loved photography. And she, he raised his daughter, whom she thinks is she thinks of herself as, as the favorite of daddy's girl, and she was the favorite child. And so she took up this uh, this art not as a hobby, but more of a vocation. And so just doing that made her father so proud and happy of her. And there was a, this connection that they had throughout the book of you know he wanted to always be an artist, but was forced into of the family company and she was able to break free of the, the family business and get out of brewing and was able to live his dream in essence. So she uh, went, she was living in San Francisco doing art when she was given a Fulbright scholarship to London. So she went to London and studied, I want to say it was for two or three years. She was there for quite a while. She went, she even extended her stay past the Fulbright scholarship just to continue doing her art and to build a reputation there in London. So she was an installation artist, which uh, means really there, there's no description of it. Any kind of piece of art that, that you want to put that you think is creative, that is installation arts. And that's what she did. Things that were just vaguely, nebulously creative and had artistic qualities. That was, that was her art. Uh, then, after getting tired of that, she's obviously now an author, uh, so she's written this book to detail her memoir of her family, but she's written others as well. I'll leave you to peruse the internet to look up those at, at, your, at your will. She also liked to end the, she book, she ended the book um, discussing, again, Detroit, but tied it to the art scene. And so, people in Detroit may know or may have seen that after the, the bankruptcy of the city and basically reaching the rock bottom that it could possibly go. And the, the housing industry had bottomed out and so rents were really low and, um, and commercial spaces were very, more, very affordable. So this attracted the poor, starving, hungry artists, right? So they, a lot of them came to Detroit and started doing their art here and it's kind of like a, a a play on the phoenix, the rising of the ashes. So a lot of people were seeing the, the death and the dreariness and the, the, just the darkness of the city and how it was still kind of burgeoning and how there were bright spots. And so the artists would pick on these bright spots or this contrast of growth versus the death. And so there are a whole lot of community, community spaces or art scenes scattered throughout the city focused on people who were doing this kind of an art. And so she kind of ties that back to how her growing up learning and loving art is kind of coming full circle from a young girl and watching the city die into now being an older woman, or at least a mature woman, and looking back at the city and seeing how it's burgeoning and how art has kind of tied through all of this. And so it's kind of her way of paying homage to, to the city and her love for the city. To summarize, uh, in the end, I liked the book. I'm no literary critic by any means. I enjoyed the reading. I think it was very well done. The stories were were enjoyable, and they tied to the, uh, the the overall theme of the book that she was doing. So there's nothing that seemed out of place. It flowed really well. I read it really relatively easily. Uh, if I had any criticism, it would be that she seemed to absolve herself from any of the uh, any of the bad things that happened to her family. So like the drug addictions or her father's addiction to spending, or what have you, whatever it is, she tried to absolve herself. She seemed to, in her own narrative, absolve herself from owning any of that responsibility. So one example that I can think of is she, uh, in, in a passing line, when she's discussing her, her brother's addiction, she says, well, for me, it was just a passing phase. For him, it became his life. Again, you know, kind of disowning that she had maybe any responsibility or helped or, you know, encouraged or anything along those lines. 
Uh, also, she kind of said when her brother was on his last legs and they were at their last meeting, she took it upon herself to sit next to him and to hug him and to love him and show you know love for the, no one else in the family could because they had distanced themselves from him just because he had been such a disappointment and had you know stolen from them and all these bad things. But she was the one that showed love to him. So if I'm critical of anything in the book, it might be of that, that she kind of seemed to put herself above the fray and tried to seem more moral or, or better than the rest of the family, which I kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. But other than that, I mean, I liked the themes of the book about the family, about the beer, about the city. The art was an interesting aspect of it, too, that I didn't consider. So I, I definitely would recommend it. I got my book from my local library. You probably can do the same and borrow it for free. It's not something that I would spend money on. I'm not even sure what the price is going for on Amazon. I'm, I'm assuming it'd be in excess of $20. So um, rent it, borrow it would be your best option if you're interested. I, I do recommend it, uh, especially if you live in Michigan, in the Detroit area specifically. It'd be kind of cool for you to read. And if you're a Stroh's beer lover, maybe uh, because Stroh's is so old, it's you know been running through families for generations. If it's something your grandfather drank or your father drank, uh, and then you're interested in a little bit of the history of it, the book has some pretty cool stories. So I, I recommend it for, for those reasons. So that's it. Thanks a lot for listening and watching. I will see you next time. And again, this is the first installment of a new segment called the Straight Beer Book Club. Come back for more and I'll uh, do more reviews in the future. Thanks for watching. Take care.